Tulsa King, which drops weekly episodes Sundays exclusively on Paramount Plus. The writer, executive producer, showrunner of the show, Terrence Winter. Great to see you. Great to be here. It's like you're back, huh? I'm back. Yeah, absolutely. Back in this world again. I, I love it. Yeah, it's great. It's where I feel uh, most comfortable. Strangely, uh, you know, it's funny when my uh, when I first met my wife, mm -hmm. uh, and she told her dad, you know, who she was dating, and, and, and he Googled me. He's like, "What's the deal with this guy? Like, all he's written is like all his horrible, violent stuff." <laughs> And I see. I also wrote the new adventures of Flipper, but nobody ever pegs me for that or Xena Warrior Princess. He wasn't, you know, they he always was, go right to the. He wasn't a fan of oh, diagnosis he a, murder. He, he was yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> well, right. That's, that's technically violent too. He is, it's yeah, Van there's Dyke. always a murder in there. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, but yeah, I get. I just get pegged for all this horrible stuff. But you know, what are you going to do? It's incredibly entertaining. Uh, and Tulsa King is the latest from Terrence Winter, who's here on the Rich Eisen Show again. New episodes of Tulsa King drops weekly Sundays on Paramount Plus, back here on our terrestrial and satellite and streaming radio audience. We just saw a great clip from Tulsa King starring Sylvester Stallone, who was on a couple weeks ago. We just said goodbye a couple days ago to Andrea Savage. We love this show. And Terrence Winter, the showrunner of the program, uh, is here on. Uh, so, uh, obviously, Taylor Sheridan yeah. is the Yellowstone man of the moment in television. Sure. He reached out to you and said, let's get let, uh, this idea, Tulsa King. Yeah, uh, we share the same agent uh, in about, I guess, a year and a half ago my agent called me and said hey i have an interesting situation uh taylor sheridan wrote a pilot like over a weekend apparently mm -hmm. uh told me the premise you know older guy you know uh, goes out to kansas city sent out to kansas city mobster uh sylvester stallone is attached taylor suggested you be to take this over because he can't possibly do it is this something you'd be interested in i said well taylor sheridan sylvester stallone oh, let me think about it for a second i was like mm -hmm. oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> said, absolutely yeah when do i start he's like right. great i'm gonna put you on a uh, zoom with taylor we Zoomed, we talked, I read the pilot, I thought it was great. I said, you know, I do have a couple of ideas. I pitched them what they were. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, great, go take it, run with it. It's your baby. I have visitation rights and see you later. And I went off and did it. And right. I li actually only met Taylor one time. Uh, once in the Zoom and once in person a week before we started shooting. And that was it. And we and then off you, know, you go. Yeah, he just, you know, we went out, he took me to dinner and was like, good luck. And we left. And, and off you go to Oklahoma. Go. Yeah. And I was you... literally on my way to Oklahoma when I stopped in Arizona to meet him. And then continued on to Oklahoma to shoot the show. So what what uh, what do you think works for you when you're writing something about a mobster who's got a dark side but also a humorous side? Where where there's a f and and it's amazing that you also worked with Scorsese for Wolf of Wall Street because that seems to be always. Uh, on, on the edge of violence, darkness, right. but humor Comedy, at the same yeah. time, you know? I, yeah. I, 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 well, I, you know, these people are so, and the world is so inherently absurd that it's if you just tell it straight, it's, yeah. it, it veers toward comedy. You don't have to write jokes, you know? I mean, it's just the, the circumstances they find themselves in. And a lot of these guys, true, a lot of mob guys are actually really funny people. Mm -hmm. Not when you owe them money. They're much less funny. Very than much so, point. correct. But they're great storytellers. They're They're hilarious. Uh, and again, I think the, the inherent absurdity of, of what it is they do and how mm -hmm. they live, it, it, you know, just lends itself to comedy. Also, just taking somebody like Sly's character and putting them in, in human situations is so it feels so odd that you, you can't help but laugh. I always tell this story. I remember we, we were at a premiere of The Sopranos and there was a scene where Tony is sitting at the kitchen counter eating cereal and reading the box of cereal, just reading the back of the box of cereal. The audience howled. It's so human, but you to see a mob boss sitting reading a box of tricks is just funny, <laughs> right? You know, and you don't have to make it funnier than it is. It just is is there, you know. So it's just sort of, and I've always gravitated toward toward this stuff and people who live outside the lines. It's just always been interesting to me and and uh, something I, I guess I do I do well. Uh, but you know, it's just you know I think the other thing too is if you take anybody, even if they're a bad person, and depict them in all the colors of human behavior yes you're gonna find moments of relatability and you know maybe not you know likability but at least understanding you know tony loves his daughter you know dwight's you know been alienated from his family and is out and you know he's been screwed over by the people he thought you know he could depend on and mm -hmm. you know you relate and you start to slowly understand and, and almost forgive them for a lot of the bad behavior terrence winner the uh, emmy award winning many times over producer writer now executive producer and showrunner of tulsa king here on the rich eisen show and again paramount plus is its home new episodes drop weekly on sundays let's dive into the sopranos a little bit here if you don't mind how'd you get first hooked up with david chase and all of that I, uh, same, my agent at the time sent me, said, I'm going to send you a videotape, I'm dating myself, of a show called The Sopranos, I want you to watch it. And I said, 
you know I, I don't know anything about opera, right? And he's like, just watch it. Uh, that I, was your first response, yeah, huh? Was yeah, it, was it not yet on? No, it was, it was not, not on the air yet. It was a show HBO was doing. They were still, uh, they were still uh, shooting it. Uh, I watched it, and I don't even think I got through the entire pilot, and I was physically trembling. I called him up. I said, you've got to get me on this show. Mm-hmm. I grew up in Brooklyn in and around a neighborhood that had a lot of guys like this. So I just completely understood this world, these guys, how they thought, how they talked. Right. I said, you've got to get me on this show. My second call was to a guy named Frank Renzulli, who was one of the people who gave me my first job. Frank was a great writer who uh, grew up in Boston in similar circumstances around mobsters. And I called him up and I said, do you know, have you seen this thing, The Sopranos? He said, yeah, I'm actually meeting with this David Chase guy on Friday. I said, you got to get me in there with you. So as it turned out, I, David had already hired his entire staff for season one. There was no more room for me, but I sat out season one as a fan and then talking to Frank Renzulli every day who got hired and actually rewriting in some cir- circumstances Frank's stuff and giving it. So I was kind of writing on the show, oh. even though David didn't know it. And when season two came along, David had you know, cleaned house of, of some of the writers in season one and said, all right, who's this guy, Terry Winter? And Frank introduced me, and I got hired, and that was just life changing. What was the writers' room like? I mean, it was great. You know, if if you were a fly on the wall in the writers' room, you would swear we were not writing the show. It was it was a bunch of people sitting around, first debating where are we going to get lunch, where the hell is lunch, when is it going to get here, and then just talking and then just telling stories. One time this happened, one time that happened. I had a dream once. And even though it looked like we weren't talking about the show, that's all we were talking about because all of this stuff was grist for the mill. So I would tell a story about something that happened to me years ago, and then two days later, David would call me up and go, what was that story again, the thing happened? And, mm-hmm. and that would find its way into the show. I can't tell you how many moments from our lives were actual moments on the show. Uh, when Tony got hit in the head with the steak from Annabelle Skewer, <laughs> That was that was me in real life. Come on, I what? swear to God, Tell me that story, I had a girlfriend in the eighties, <laughs> and uh, she kind of looked like Annabelle a little bit. And um, I um, ended a fight with her. She was making dinner, and I, I thought I was going to be cool. And I was like, "Are you going to cook or what?" And she said, "Oh, are you hungry?" And I went, "Oh man, that's not the response I thought I was going to get." And I started heading for the door, and she hurled a piece of London broil at me like Sandy Koufax from thirty <laughs> feet away. Whap, right in the back of the head. And I got on the elevator of the apartment building and had like blood dripping off of me juice. And, you know, his family was like looking at me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was trying to be nonchalant. Like, you know, I always walk around like this. And a month later, we sat down to dinner and she said, do you know what that is? I, I said, she said, that's the London broil I hit you with. I picked it up and washed it. And so she it. did in fact she cook. She did, yes. She did cook eventually. <laughs> but I was like, that, you know, that's that's going to end up. Wow. So, so many of those moments. And, and in a lot of things, at Boardwork Empire, same thing, so many incidents in your life. So, the writer's room was a lot of things. Like, you know, David would even just throw out, like, what is the worst thing you've ever done to somebody in a relationship? I mean, what is the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you? What are the things you're least proud of? Most, uh, you know, most ashamed of? You know, all of this stuff is grist for the mill, and it's all human, and, and hopefully it's all stuff we can relate to. And for me, that's the best kind of writing, the stuff that comes from people's real. And so um, how, do, how, how, how far in advance, though, were were storylines and plot lines mapped out because you know for shows like the sopranos shows like boardwalk it shows that you do mm-hmm. everybody or, or breaking bad for instance which i know yeah. you have you, that's not your your show but i just people see something in season four and go oh i remember something from season one they're just laying the groundwork was that the way it was done sometimes for the you know sometimes you you know well a good good example from the sopranos is you know when we got into season five you know we had always talked about this legendary mobster named feach lamana uh, and and at the beginning of the show, at the beginning of the season, I said to the writer's assistant, have, have we ever said that Feech Lamana is alive or dead? And she came back in and she said, no, I went through all the scripts. We've just, just referenced them. So I, I said, well, what if Feech Lamana is getting out of jail and he's an old guy? Let's meet him. And we're like, great. So Robert Loggia, who you and I talked about yeah. before, Staten Island. played uh, played Feech Lamana, the legend, you know, who this, these guys idolized and got out of jail. And we got to meet him over the course of however many episodes he was on. But stuff like that where, you know, you go, oh, it looks like they were setting this up forever, actually was an afterthought. And we went back and retrofitted it and it worked perfectly. I love that. I've got three episodes of yours that I, from The Sopranos I want to hit on. Um, let's start with um, season three, episode 11. You know what I'm talking about, uh, I'm sure, yes. just from that. The Pine Barrens, um, which was directed by Steve Buscemi. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Who obviously wound up becoming Nucky Thompson yep. in yeah, so many yeah. other uh, and aspects. Th- this is how I met Empire. Steve, actually. That's I, how you met him? I had been a huge fan of Steve's as an actor. I'd watched everything he'd ever done. And, and, and then, you know, 
know, watch the movies he directed. He directed Trees Lounge and a few other things. And uh, it's interesting. People look at Pine Barrens, and because it takes place in the snow, they go, oh, of course, I got Steve Buscemi because he's got this Fargo parallel, which is absolutely not true at all. The way it works is you hire your directors months and months in advance. Mm -hmm. You have a schedule and uh, slots, and months earlier you go, okay, well, Tim Van Patten will direct this episode, and Alan Coulter will direct that episode, and, oh, Steve Buscemi's going to direct whatever episode 11 ends up being. We didn't even know what it was going to be, you know, way in advance. So when I wrote Pine Barrens, originally it just took place in the, in the woods without snow. It was in the wintertime, but it was just in the woods, mm -hmm. and we scattered our location, and Steve was directing, and we broke for the holidays. I think it was like 99 into 2000. And we all left and said, all right, well, as long as it doesn't snow, we'll be fine. <laughs> and we came back, and there was a massive blizzard over the holidays. And we were like, what are we going to do now? We went to our location, and it was just white as far as I could see. It was actually still snowing the day we started shooting the episode. It just the last few snowflakes were landing. And we said, all right, well, this is even better. I mean, it's even more dire. Uh, you know, and David Chase said, well, how do they, have, they could just trace their footsteps back. How are they going to get lost? And I said, look. My sense of direction is so bad, I guarantee you I could get lost. Footsteps or no footsteps, they're getting lost. Uh -huh. So I did a quick rewrite to accommodate the snow, and it just elevated it, you know, by 30%, you know, the whole the whole circumstance so they were in. So what was the goal of that episode? And by that I mean, because obviously it's technically self-contained. We still mm -hmm. don't know where Valerie is today. Yeah, we right. don't know where the Russian is today, and sure. I want to get to that in a second. But there's such a, a character development element to mm -hmm. this uh, i'm fascinated by how you came up with it what your goal from that episode well it, was. it started it wasn't my idea tim van patten who was one of our directors on the show and went on to uh, executive produce and direct many boardwalk empire episodes happened to walk into the writer's office one day i was sitting there with todd kessler who's another writer mm -hmm. and uh, tim said what are you guys doing i said we're just kicking around ideas he said i i have an i had an idea for an episode but it's really stupid i said well, what is it he goes well it's a dream i had that paulie and christopher took a guy into the woods and, and to kill him, and they got lost. I said, that's great. You got to go pitch it to David. He goes, no, oh, I'm embarrassed. I said, well, I'm going in there right now. I knocked on David's door. I said, Dave, you got to hear this idea. I pitched it to him. I said, he's great. Let's do it. But, you know, we can't do it in season two. That was when he pitched it. Mm -hmm. But we'll do that in season three. So season three came along, and I ended up writing it. And uh, it had another storyline with Meadow and her uh, Jackie Jr. in college and Tony getting hit with the stake uh, was part of that as well. That's right. And, uh, you know, really it was just, you know, it was <laughs> kind of like a departure. You know, that was a, a season that also had the episode where Melfi got raped, which was the most dramatic episode we've done. And then, mm -hmm. th you know, a couple episodes later is this farce, basically. These the two guys at each other's throats under these, you know, for me that, you know, that's the best kind of comedy. Two guys in a pressure cooker you know, at each other is, mm -hmm. you know, for me, always, always great. It's Abbott and Costello, it's the Three Stooges, it's, you know, it, it's all that stuff. So, uh, you know, and it's interesting, too. I mean, it's, you know, so much talk in the mob about loyalty and, you know, the America, and these guys turn on each other at the drop of a hat, oh, sure. you know, like constantly, you know, and it, just uh, how quick, you know, they've only missed a meal or two when they are ready to kill each other. I spent you know? the rest of the series wondering when the Russian was going to come back. Yeah, yeah, you and a lot of other well, people. Well, I mean, because he, he is, they shot him. It looked right. like he was dead, but they yeah. couldn't find him. Right. And we all, I always thought, uh, didn't you always think that he's just going to come back season four, season five, whatever, and then it'd be a big problem for everybody. I think we right? just assume being huge fans of the show and knowing sure. how, like, kind of it works, like, oh, this guy's going to pop up up in season five yeah, somewhere right, right. and there you was know, never a plan for that there there was never a plan you know and that's david's you know everything we did was you know the opposite of what you would expect and, you know for for decades we're trained by watching network tv yeah. that they're going to catch the murderer it's going to be explained everything's wrapped up in a bow and you know david used to say cynically and buy this soap you know that's the function of network <laughs> tv on on hbo is very often we don't care if you buy anything because there's no commercials and sometimes life doesn't work out the way sometimes you don't know what happened and, right. and that's you know arguably much more satisfying so as the seasons progressed i said to david you know wouldn't it be cool to just sort of you know what to answer that question and i i had him i said what if you know you know they go to visit uh slava the russian uh, mob boss and they walk in and there is Valerie sweeping the floor. And he and Christopher lock eyes, and Christopher, you know, is petrified, and Valerie turns around, and half the back of his head is literally gone. <laughs> and the guy's a ve basically a vegetable. But he can't say anything, and, yeah. and, and that's all, we, you know, but that's, th that's what happened. They obviously found him, rehabilitated him, et cetera. And Dave was on, on board with it for a nanosecond, and I made the critical mistake of saying, the audience will love this. And he went, 
I'm not here to just make people laugh. Oh, I wish fulfillment. Oh, you know, we can't. I'm not just doing like what the audience wants every time. And I was like, oh man, I should be showing so him. close. Yes. And then he's like, we're not doing it. And By that the way, was it. I would have loved that. That would have been perfect. perfect. You're, you're, you're correct. The audience would have loved it. They would have. We were in the audience. But the most we gave them was there was a conversation at the Bada Bing, I think, where they just, somebody said, somebody was reminiscing about the Russian and. Paulie said, or Christopher said, well, I think maybe he got eaten by squirrels or something. That's fantastic. That's about as much closure, closure as you'll get. Terrence Winter here on the Rich Eisen Show. We're going down some Sopranos memory lane with you. Uh, another episode I want to hit you with is season five, episode 12. I think this is the greatest episode of the Sopranos, long-term Thank parking. You. Thanks. Where, so you are, it was planned well in advance, I imagine, that Adriano was going to yeah, meet her yeah. maker. And, and so... How did you come up with the method in which she finally, that, spoiler alert. But. You know, yeah, I, I mean, it was, uh, we knew Sylvia was going to do it. Uh, it was really interesting for me, you know, going back af after the fact and looking at how I had written that. Because I, I've written some of the most horrible violence on screen. I never shied away from showing it. You right. know, obviously on HBO we, we had the... Uh, ability to really be graphic and you know not I don't think we were gratuitous but it, it got ugly you right. know I mean I, especially you know we felt it wanted we needed to be ugly because these are not we're not you know every once in a while the audience would fall into the uh, notion that these guys were cuddly teddy bears and then they would be reminded yeah they're not they're horrible killers they're horrible people so when I wrote it uh, I scripted it that you know Silvio drags her out of the car she crawls off camera and he walks out of the frame and you hear a gunshot and the camera drifts into the sky. And that's exactly how Tim Van Patten shot it. And afterward, I thought, that is really weird. And I realized I did not want to see Adriana get killed. Neither did I. I didn't want to see it. I was and so I, shocked. I was so dismayed. I like. I, I think my wife and I, we sat there in silence after yeah, that episode really for hard. a few minutes. It was really hard to write because I loved Drea also. Right. Now, obviously, that was her swan song, but I love the character, and I just did not want to see that happen. And then, of course, you know, we what ended up happening is is kind of the Pine Barren thing, where people in the audience said, "Oh, she's not really dead. She's going to come back." And he's like, "No, she's dead. She's absolutely dead. We we don't do that. You know mm -hmm. that she, it's, yes. she's absolutely dead, and that that's not how. But but we, again, we're so programmed from you know being trained by TV and or network TV to think like, oh, there's there's a reason they didn't show that, and it's actually the real reason was just my own. Psychology. I just love the fact that you call it long-term parking too. Yeah, yeah. Or how obviously we know that she's that's where she's deposited. Yeah, in, in a in a car and it's parked. And, yeah, I don't know or, that, or, that was. Or car, or yeah, cars the been cars, parked there. We don't know where. Right. That there. Yeah, to I didn't it seem like she's 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 absconded and she's gone off to avoid the the feds. Yeah. Um. But um. It. I, I'm just um, like, why? Why choose that as the name? It's just I didn't choose it. I think I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think that was Robin Green, uh, one of our other uh, writers okay. who chose that. So I, I kind of inherited that title, but I was like, I couldn't have come up with anything nearly as good. Certainly, it was just perfect. It just felt, you know, long term parking is just like forever. It's like just sort of, you know, she's she's parked wherever she's parked wherever you know, she is forever yeah long so term just, ooh, perfect yeah. last episode as well um it's the first episode of the final season members only right and uh, i'm going to return to the subject that uh everything um on the sopranos is planted and seeds are, are are planted now this is the final season though and we all know that tony um in the final scene there's a guy in a members only jacket mm -hmm. the first episode is called members only right and uncle june uncle junior um uh, shoots tony in the first yeah. episode in some sort of moment where his mind is addled and he's mm -hmm. he he's he's not all there right is this a foreshadowing is the whole thing name shooting tony a calling it members only a total foreshadowing of the final no. episode <laughs> Sorry to, sorry not at to, all, huh? No, not at all. Good theory. No, I mean, you know, the members only jacket was just sort of a thing in New York, and it certainly is. Uh, guys of a certain age, like, still wear members only jackets. Like, in the 80s, that was a big thing. So you got a lot of guys in that community that were wearing members only jackets, and mm -hmm. it, it just sort of became a thing. And then I, I don't know uh, exactly how I came up with that title, but it just seemed to fit. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's funny, one of my memories of that episode, and it's not, uh, has nothing to do with your question, of course, sure. but it's okay. shooting the Please. scene where Tony got shot, uh, Jim Gandolfini's first take, and again, this was brilliantly directed by Tim Van Patten, uh, Jim was writhing on the floor, holding his stomach, and he's trying to get to the telephone, and right. Uncle Junior had run upstairs and scurried under the bed or wherever he was hiding, and Jim was just worked himself up into such a frenzy 
scrambling to try to get the, the phone, and he's coughing and spitting and holding his stomach. And at one point, he actually vomited. And in real life, in real life, uh -huh. in the on the first take, and we it was this was after a minute and a half of writhing on the floor trying to get to the telephone, and we had just cut. Tim had just yelled "cut," and Jim puked, and I turned to our camera operator Billy Coleman. I said, "Did you get that?" He went, "I just cut." Oh. I, he didn't get it. I was like, oh, it was so perfect. I mean, of course, now, you know, you could digitize stuff like that, but it was such a real moment. And Jim was so in the moment and so committed, he actually made himself vomit, you know, as if he had been shot in the stomach. And it was just so brilliant. And, I, you know, I said, you got another one? And you go, <laughs> I don't think so. I, I, you know, maybe come back tomorrow. But it, it's, I mean, it still worked brilliantly. But it was like, man, we talk about watching a consummate actor. What was it like? Jump. Oh, he's amazing. He was, yeah, I mean, he's such an incredible guy, so generous, so sweet, nothing remotely like Tony Soprano at all. Actually, if you see the movie Enough Said uh, with Julie Louis Dreyfus, sure, yes. one of the last things he did, yes. that's the closest you'll see to the real Jim. That's that's who Jim was, you know, to me. And watching it was doubly sad because you feel like you're watching your friend Jim and such a sweetheart and just courage, courageous. Like, you know, this, uh, I mean, I have acted, you know, a, a, I don't even call it that, it, 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 to be able to stand in front of a group of people with cameras everywhere and forget yourself completely and, and behave in a certain way and, and, and do things that are horrible and ugly and, and just be in the moment is so hard. So it's funny when people say to me when they want to goof on actors and go, oh, what's my motivation? I go, you obviously have never tried to do this before. Mm -hmm. It is so hard. And to do it well, you get up to a Jim Gandolfini or an Edie Falco you know, or a Sly or a, you know, a Steve Sandy, huh? Bobby? Cannavale, yeah, the best. <laughs> and they make it look easy, and it's the hardest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. It really is. So last one for you on this. Mm -hmm. uh, you just said moments ago um, how you were attuned to what the uh, – you made it uh, – uh, an aside about what you, you told David Chase previously on an idea that you had, and he's like – you know, you said that it, it would be great for the audience. The audience would love it. So clearly you're attuned to what the audience of The Sopranos is all about. Knowing how it was going to end before we mm -hmm. all saw it as an audience, right. how did you feel the audience was like when you found out how it was going to end in the writer's room or however you yeah, did yeah, find yeah. out? How did you think the audience would take it? I thought they would take it a lot better than they did, honestly. <laughs> I thought it was really cool. I thought it was really interesting. But by that point, I guess I was, I was programmed to try to look at storytelling the way David did, uh -huh. and I still do. Like, let's do something unexpected. Let's go the opposite way of what you think is going to happen. It's so hard to be ahead of the audience. It's so difficult. You know, again, all, most of us have been watching TV for decades. Cinema has been around for over 100 years. We we know all the tricks. You, you know instinctively, you know the language of film, and you know if there's a, a shot of the coffee cup, the coffee cup's probably going to come back and mean something later. And so it's, it's, as a writer and a storyteller, you're always trying to find the different way in. So I think it was about a year before the finale ended. I think Matt Weiner and I were in the room and David came in and he said, I, I, I think I know how the series ends. And he says, I think I'm just going to cut to black. I went, wow. He goes, yeah, I think I just, I'm just going to stop it mid sentence. And then a month later he came in, he said, I, I just heard the song on the radio. That's going to be the, it's don't stop believing. He just heard it on the radio yep. and said, that's the one. He said, that's it. He said, there's something about that song. And I said, wow, interesting. And he had it in his head. And then we, we watched it and I, I watched, he, I was sat in an editing room with him and watched the ending of that show 50 times. Uh -huh. And he would change like one frame and go, what do you think, this one or that one? I go, fine. He's like, I honestly can't tell anymore. I don't know. They're all great. They all are. So I really was on board. And I, uh, I flew back. My son was just born. My wife and I flew back to New York uh, at the, at, to, to introduce the baby to my family, my siblings, and uh, aunts and uncles and everybody. And it happened to be the airing of the finale and of Sopranos that night. We were all going to watch it together. And I said, you guys, you wanna this is really cool. And it ended and they turned on me like a pack of wolves. What the hell was that? And I was like, oh, we got to go. The baby's got to go. And I just left. I was like, wow, I did not expect that. I, and then this uproar, yeah. of, you know, what the hell? And, and then, you know, I've asked people, I go, well, what did you want? Did you want to see Tony get killed in front of his family? Went, no, of course not. Did you want to see the, the whole family get slaughtered? No, no. I said, well, what did you want? I don't know. And I go, all right, well, this was different, right? Maybe he died. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. Nobody knows. I, what I will say, and I have said a million times, is if he didn't die that night, one day somebody in a members-only jacket or something is going to come out of a bathroom somewhere, and maybe it was that night. And I said, what I always took from that is when you're Tony Soprano, even going out to ice cream with your with your family is fraught with looking over your shoulder. Yeah. Who's that guy? Why is that guy looking at me? 
that's the that's what you've created for yourself, and that's sort of the point. And whether it was that night or whether it never happened, I don't know. And I'm glad we don't know. My wife and I had a whole bunch of people over. We got uh, <laughs> we got uh, you know chicken parm. We had the whole thing. We had uh, you know uh, 12, 15 people in the house. Show ends and everybody looks at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thinking I forgot to pay the direct TV Absolute bill. Course. Like they're like, yeah. what did you know? Like it, and it just happened <laughs> to go off right at this moment. Absolutely. And then five. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, oh. Uh, by the way, as you know, it was the, the 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 dip to black was long enough for me to basically tell everybody, yeah, like, yeah. what are you looking at yeah, me for? Yeah, like yeah. there was an exchange Something's going on, and then yeah. the credits yeah. rolled, yeah. and After then I was a off long the grill. Time. Yeah, yeah. Like, Somebody told me they they were with the, it, watching with their grandmother, and as soon as it went to black, the grandmother went, I didn't touch the remote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, but just, it was supposed yeah. to be longer, right? Terrence, didn't David Chase want like 30 seconds? He didn't of black? want credits at all. And the DGA, I think, or the DGA or the Writers Guild, or whoever it was, the, 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 the guilds would not allow it. They said, no, you have to have credits. Because he just wanted to go black and that was it. That's it? And yeah, and nothing. Coming up next, Sex in the City? I yeah, mean, like, what, and that was it. And they, yeah, well, so they, that was the was. only thing that at least let people know, oh, yeah, it actually is. Wow. You know, so he held it as long as he could. So last one. Uh, yeah. Nobody, sure. nobody said to David ever, maybe we should not end it this way? Nobody that offered pushback? Not to my back knowledge. To I mean, you know, we by that point in the series, uh, you know, David wasn't getting notes from HBO or anybody. I know. And, you know, in terms of the inner circle, you know, at that point it was me, Matt Weiner, Tim Van Patten, yeah. and Alan Calder. And we all actually really liked it. So when we weren't blowing smoke, we really thought it was yeah. great. And, and, and again, I thought the audience was going to think it was cool too. And uh, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I thought maybe everybody thought like that they, there would be like a taxi driver like finish. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Like somebody's going right. to come in, right? It'll and be some you know, big shootout. And it's right. Yeah. Some day rain's going to come and wash it all off the street. Yeah. And, and that that's right there in the diner. Right. But again, that's you know that's the the element of surprise. That's what you probably think right. is going to happen. Chances are then yeah. that's not what's the Russians happen. not showing up. Nope, not coming. You know, David used to say, and I don't know who, who to attribute this to, but he said, art asks questions, it doesn't give answers. And I, I don't know who originally said that, but I love that. Art you know? asks questions. It doesn't give answers. Doesn't give answers. Yeah. I mean, you know, think about it. When, you know, walking out of a movie, and we used to go, God, what, what do you think that meant? Or what do you think happened to them afterwards? As opposed to, here is the spoon-fed version of stuff. I remember I was watching um, Out of the Past, this old film noir. Oh, sure. Um, great movie. Oh, yeah. I think at the end of the movie... Um, I think Robert Mitchum dies. And I remember thinking, oh, no, he, he can't he can't really be dead. And then I was thinking, oh, yeah, no, back in the day, they used to kill people. <laughs> yeah. They used it because they, they, there's not going to be out of the past too, further out of the past. Sure. This is it. This is the movie. He dies and you move on. And it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, they used to, that's how it used to be. Hey. And you killed the hero or things like that. The star and, you know, of your current show, Rocky Lost. Yeah, absolutely, you know, I mean, which is happen. so great. Yeah, I, know, I mean, right? that was so much better than if you won. Terrence absolutely. Winter here on the Rich Eisen Show. One more segment with him. Today's interview is sponsored by Audible. Audible is where you'll find the best stories on sports and entertainment. It's the home of storytelling. Listen to audiobooks, originals, and podcasts, including the Rich Eisen Show. Sign up for free for a 30-day trial at audible.com. You can listen to Boardwalk Empire on Audible with a forward by you, Terrence Winter. Um, let's get into Boardwalk Empire here. Um, Scorsese directed the pilot, yeah. and was that? I, I'm just trying to know in my head. Was that before, or after Wolf of Wall Street? Had you already that worked was together? Right at the same time. I, I literally wrote the pilot for Boardwalk Empire and the script for Wolf of Wall Street within two months of each other. Jeez, it's just a weird, uh, weird coincidence. <laughs> wow. Uh, I had just finished up on The Sopranos. Uh, I was on a deal at HBO, which means I was going to continue to work sure. there and develop something. And I had a couple of ideas, and I was meeting with Carolyn Strauss, who was at the time the president of HBO, and we kicked around a few things. And she said, you know, I have this book. It's it's kind of the history of Atlantic City. Yeah, it's called Boardwalk Empire. And I was like, you know, thinking to myself, oh, my God. <laughs> You're going back How about in. a telephone book? You know, it sounded horribly boring. Uh, oh, I see. And she said, why don't you read it and see if you think there's a TV series in there? And I was like, okay. And, and literally on my way out the door, she goes, oh, and uh, Martin Scorsese is attached to that. And I turned around <laughs> and I said, I don't even have to read it. It's yes, it. there's a TV series in here and I'm going to find it. And I went home and I said to my wife, they just gave me a series. She said, what do you, what do you mean? I said, if Martin Scorsese is actually attached to this book and mm -hmm. I don't screw this up, mm -hmm. they're going to do it. So she will go figure it out. So I read the book. And for the most part, it, you know, it, again, it is the history of Atlantic City. Not a lot going on until you get to the Prohibition era. And there's this guy named Nucky Johnson, who I changed later to Nucky Thompson. Mm -hmm. 
uh, who ran, he was a corrupt politician who ran Atlantic City on the uh, the seaboard during Prohibition. That's where all the alcohol came in from uh, across the sea. Mm -hmm. And he was friends with Lucky Luciano and all Rothstein and Al Capone. I was like, this is the show. That's the guy. Scorsese had never done anything in that era before. So originally he was just supposed to produce it. So I got a call. I'm going to go meet Martin Scorsese and I'm going to pitch him on the idea. So I pitched, it on, pitched him. He said, great, love it, go write it. I wrote the pilot. I handed in the pilot. Oh, and I think as I uh, handed it in, it was right around uh, the time I also just signed to do uh, Wolf of Wall Street, which I hadn't written yet either. Uh, but when I wrote the pilot for Boardwalk Empire, I handed it in to him, and he called me up, and he said, um, God, I really love this. He goes, uh, I, I think I might want to direct this. And oh my I God. almost right. fell out of my chair. <laughs> and he said, how do, we, uh, how do we move this forward? I said, I said, there's a guy named Richard Plepler at HBO. I yeah. said, if you call Richard and tell him what you just told me, I'm pretty sure this is going to move forward pretty quickly. Yeah. And I hung up, and five minutes later, I get a text from Richard, just all exclamation points. That's it. <laughs> Nothing else. Just like, holy crap, Martin Scorsese. So it wasn't, it was like the first day of shooting. I still didn't believe it was happening. I remember it was 6 a.m., Tim Van Patten and I, Tim was the executive producer of Boardwalk Empire along with me. We're standing on the set, and a car pulls up, and Martin Scorsese gets out, and he goes, all right, let's rehearse. And we looked at each other and said, oh, this is actually, he's actually doing this. And then it was, it was amazing. And we, we uh, you know, just to sit and watch him do it. And it was interesting that the, the process of building up to him shooting the show was, you know, the, the research. So we got to go to Martin Scorsese's screening room and sit and watch pretty much every gangster movie ever made along with Martin Scorsese. Get out of here. Commenting on the movie while we're watching it. Literally just like punching each other in the leg, wow. like listening to him talk about you know, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre or uh, the Al Capone movie with Rod Steiger and just, just uh, you know, all of these Come movies. On. It was like the most incredible experience ever. And then we start shooting and Marty's directing and he's, you know, he, you know, he's incredibly collaborative too, which is so great. And, you know, this is one of those things that go, you know, don't meet your idols. You know, he is exactly, and I say this about Sly, you can meet this guy. Yeah. He's so cool. He's exactly what you hope he's going to be, this funny New York guy. And he's truly the reason I started doing this. I saw Taxi Driver as a teenager, and I walked out of that movie, and I thought, this is different than other movies. Why? And I, I saw it probably 15 times over that summer. Mm. And I said, like, who's this Martin Scorsese guy, and why is this different, and what else has he done? And that was the thing that set me on the path to thinking about movies as something as other than to do on a Friday night. And so so he's the guy. He's the reason I'm doing this. So we, we start shooting, and he's off, and he parks himself. He gets like in a curtain room. It's just him and the script supervisor, and they're watching the film. So... First day on set, Michael Pitt, who plays Jimmy Darmody, is a young man in 1920, and he's supposed to walk into a room full of women with where Nucky is and, and tell Nucky something, and he's wearing a hat. So Michael walks in, and he whispers to Nucky, and I realize he doesn't take his hat off. In 1920, if you walked into a room full of women, you take your hat off. Mm -hmm. So I watched another take, and he doesn't take his hat off. So I went up to the first assistant director, and I said, um, I have a note from Marty. How do, how do I do this? And he said, I don't know. No one's ever given Marty a note. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God, of course. He's Martin Scorsese. What am I, crazy? I said, well, this is kind of important. He goes, he's behind that curtain over there. And it's like, it's like Oz. So it was the longest walk of my life. I had to walk to the curtain and knock on the door, really timid. And I was like, Marty, he goes, what, what's the matter? He goes, I'm so sorry to bother you. I just have... I just noticed, like, Michael, you know, it's 1920. He goes, oh, you're right. Absolutely. Oh, Mark, Michael's got to take that Production assistant scrambling, get the hat, take the hat, Mike's got to take the hat, <laughs> running all over the place. So, so he said, if you see anything like that, just just tell me. I said, like, oh, great, thanks. So during the course of the pilot, there's like maybe one or two other times where I knock on his door. I said, Marty, I noticed it. And I think like the fourth time I knocked on the door and he like took his glasses and went, yes. And I went, you know what? <laughs> We're Forget good. it. I'm good. I'm leaving. <laughs> and I went and I went home and I was like, you know, he, he probably, he knows what he's doing. So, but it was great. He's been, we've obviously worked together a couple of times. He vinyly did the pilot for that and was my partner on that. Wolf of Wall Street. I did another, uh, this little short film with him. So he's, uh, he's again, you know, one of my idols and the reason I do this. And it was just a dream come true. I could literally talk to you for another hour. Unfortunately, our show's over in about a minute and a half. Um, I would love to have you back maybe yeah, when Tulsa course. King's at the end and, I, you know, we can have you, you know back. Where to get I have me. a I love million it. more questions Absolutely. for you about what you've done and how your thought process sure. in it. And, 
anybody who's just heard the last 40 minutes, obviously you have to watch Tulsa King because it is just up the alley of everything that we've just talked about. New episodes of Tulsa King drop weekly on Sundays, exclusively on Paramount. Sylvester Stallone at the top, uh, along with Andrea Savage, Martin Starr, who is hilarious, um, and so many other talented actors and actresses. Um, thank you for coming on. Thank you. My pleasure. I mean, Thanks for having so me. So many great stories, man. Thank you. I don't even know what to choose from. And, and, you know, Cannavale is one of our favorite human oh, beings, too. he's just the best. He's the greatest. Isn't he? Yep. I mean, yep. you know, if we, had, if we had more time, you said earlier that there are some things, so I'll just real quick, some things from your real life that wound up in Boardwalk Empire. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. None of them have to do with Jip Rossetti, right? None of it. Jim Rossetti is actually based on a guy I know really well. And oh my I, God! When I explained, I explained that guy to I explained that guy to Bobby Cannavale, and I said basically, and I used this line in the show. I said, "This is a guy who could find an insult in a bouquet of roses." I told him about the guy. This is this is the kind of guy who said, "Hey, you look good today." He goes. I didn't look good yesterday. What are you saying? I was like, wait, before you know well, it, you're like, that. I, and he said, Fantastic. I totally got it. And then Bobby came back and he was Jip Rossetti. I was like, that's the guy. That's the guy. Yep. Terrence Winter here <laughs> on the Rich Eisen Show. 